is just go where we were last week and go to the next book. Yeah. Second Corinthians and then on to Galatians. So. <clears throat> Always powerful when we start a new book. And it's good to, to uh, be reminded of the who, what, where, when, why, how of the book. Um, for Galatians, the who is pretty easy. It's there in the first verse. Just like a lot of Paul's letters, it's the first thing that we read. Paul. That's the who. Who wrote the book. Now, to whom it was written to is not just uh, a specific church because Galatia is not a city. It is more of a region. It was like Sonoma County is for us. It's a region where there's a lot of different cities, and so there would be a lot of different churches um, addressed in this letter that Paul writes. And that uh, Again, why this book is so important, I think, stands out the most to me. Um, and w w actually, the what. <laughs> what is this book about? I could say... Um, one of the main themes is to walk by faith, uh, but subheading, why it's so important too, is the warning against legalism, another subject that it could be about. Or we might say the warning against works and thinking that you can be saved because you've done certain things, because you've, you know... Uh, come under some legal and binding relationship with God. Praise God, that's not what it's like. And Galatians is the book um, that really points it out. In fact, uh, without this book, it was Martin Luther, uh, the early uh, scholar, that said of the book of Galatians that this was his book. And he even went so far as to say, I have chosen to be betrothed to the book of Galatians. He loved it this much. And the reason was because he was so caught up in rituals, in what we would call religion, what we would call what a lot of different uh, denominations teach. And um, he was caught up in all of that. In fact, uh, Paul the Apostle, we all know, was a Pharisee when he was Saul of Tarsus. And so the perfect guy uh, to write this, and it comes straight from his heart. Um, and so, yeah, the warning against legalism, the warning against works-based uh, Christianity, which still is out there, people teaching other things, um, and leaving the simplicity that is in Christ, and that is the title of our message tonight. It's very simple. The gospel. And what I love about Galatians, especially chapter 1, is the return to the gospel that we all need. No matter how well you might think you know the gospel, we have to be reminded of it again. Um, even if you've read uh, and you're very familiar with it, um, reacquaint yourself and get, get more... Uh, into it because a lot of people have a hard time defining and even saying what is the gospel and so we're all going to learn that together going through the book of Galatians so chapter 1 verse 1 Paul an apostle not of men neither by man but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches. There's the plural. It's not one church just in a specific city, but rather there's many different ones in many different cities in the region of Galatia. Verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God to whom God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Enough to chew just in these first five verses. Um, right off the bat, Paul goes again 
to his qualifications and uh, the authority that has been given to Paul was not given to him by any man. But, and it wasn't of man, uh, but rather it was by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And what I, what I love is Paul is reminding us again of the simplicity of the gospel in just that first verse. This is what it's all about. That Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Remember the very last chapter of 1 Corinthians. One of the most important chapters in the Bible, I think. And that's the resurrection. The chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter of the resurrection. Anytime we can, bring it up. I don't know why we talk about it once a year. Easter. <laughs> Even that name, Easter, I have a hard time saying because it's really Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's celebrating, it's remembering, it's always looking at the resurrection. It ought not to be one day a year. It, ought to, it, it really should not be just this thing that we look at every once in a while. Rather, like Paul, the Apostle, in his writings, look for it and you'll see he brings up Jesus being raised from the dead over and over and over again. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 15, right? It's empty without it. We are the most miserable and pitiable people without this very fact. And it's not just a, an opinion that Paul had. It's not just some tradition. But this really happened. Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And that's powerful. That's all the authority that we need, by the way. If that's what you're holding your position by, that's it. You've got it. Because you don't need any certificate saying this is given to me by some uh, professor or you know some doctorate or some, you know, that that can come in handy in the world's eyes. But really, in God's eyes, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> because He's the one that gives authority. And I love Pastor Chuck used to remind us all the time. The founder of Calvary Chapel, Pastor Chuck, used to say, we cannot ordain people. We never will ordain people to be pastors, to be ministers. And yet, here we have thousands of Calvary chapels, probably a lot more, <laughs> all, all over the world with pastors that have been ordained. Who are they ordained by? God. And he would remind us, there is no ordination of men that means anything. And the world scratches their heads. The people that are carnally minded kind of don't get that. They are used to the credentials of of men and, and the way that we are, we're even uh, raised, the way that we're conditioned is to think that this makes you important. That you have a uh, some kind of degree, that you have a diploma. Um, that really does not make you any different in God's eyes. And I love that. Again, simplicity, right? God shows no partiality. We do. We'll hire somebody because they have the credentials. They're, they have the experience. Not God. In fact, He does not call the qualified, right? He qualifies the called. He makes us qualified. And I love that. God is looking for availability, not great ability. Write all these down if you, got, if you don't already have these memorized or haven't heard them. It's, it's all truths that go throughout history. God is looking for anybody to just be available, not somebody who's got some great ability. Sometimes we think we're not able to serve God because I don't have the abilities necessary. Scratch that completely out of your head and understand that we're not called by any man. These are not teachings given by man. Um, and, ra and, and the authority, again, the end of verse 1, it's all because God raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> and so, verse 2, 
all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. We read this. Um, Paul had a, had a heart for all the brethren. We ought to have a heart for every single church in our county. Every brother, every sister in the Lord. I hope you know that the church is a body. The church has many different members. And we ought to steer clear, stay away from the club mentality where we start to get into cliques. But to be all about all the brethren, all the sisters which are with you in this race. And then grace and peace, the Siamese twins of the New Testament. Paul always wanted to remind us, this is what makes up the church, by the way. Grace and peace. Just after mentioning all the churches there in Galatia, he goes, grace and peace. Meaning, the, the Greeks had a casual greeting, and it was charis, grace. That was what they said when you came over to, and, and instead of hello, how are you? It was grace be to you. And the Jews, not only the Greeks or the Gentiles, we might even say, but the Jews had a very casual, and they still do the, to this day, peace, shalom, meaning all be well with you. <laughs> I hope all is well. Shalom, peace. And in that very simple phrase, you have the church. Gentiles and Jews before the church. Understand this. We're spoiled because we've always known a church just being a group of a bunch of losers that get together. Before the New Testament, before Paul the Apostle comes onto the scene, we would only have synagogue. The Jewish, the Jewish believers. And in fact, um, this is going to address, the book of Galatians is going to address those who came in saying, you must follow Moses' commands. You must become a Jew to be saved. And that's what Paul is going to get at. That's what he's going to... Uh, and he, he hints in all of his letters, he reminds us this makes up the church of Christ the Gentiles and the Jews together as one. Unheard of, unthinkable. And even to this day, if you even you know, think that thought, many Jews today think you're uh, out of your mind. Perish the thought, they would say. Why? Because they hold so hard to and hold so tight to traditions. That is what makes them honorable in their eyes. I've kept my traditions. I'm great at keeping tradition. And in fact, they are. They hand down their traditions to from generation to generation, and they're, it's powerful, but don't uh, ever think that that will save or ever believe that others ought to do that. And again, the gospel, if, if I could choose one verse, it's verse 4. The gospel. Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So, it's the gospel. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins that he might save you. I didn't say I needed saving. <laughs> he might deliver us from, get this part now, underline and make sure you understand, this is an evil world. I'm sorry to burst a bubble, but this world is evil. It's full of all kinds of just perverted, wicked, twisted, evil. And we don't like to acknowledge it, ever. But that is the... When we realize that, it's, it reminds us, I need to be delivered from this evil world. And in fact, I even contri contribute to that evil. 
In other words, I'm evil. I'm wicked. It's the opposite. And in fact, grace is the ultimate insult to our pride. Grace and the gospel, in fact, in its entirety, the gospel message is the ultimate insult to pride. Arrogancy. Thinking, I'm the man. Thinking, I've got it. I've got this. Which, we all have that in our nature. And of course, it's Him. That, that's where the glory belongs forever and ever. Verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You've left the simple gospel and you've gone so soon, he says at the beginning of verse 6. That's what's surprising. He walked, Paul maybe was there a few years ago, and now he comes back, now he's writing to them and saying, I marvel, I'm amazed that so soon you're ready to turn to this other gospel, which is not another, verse 7. It's not even another gospel, really, but there be some that trouble you. There's the false teachers and would pervert the gospel. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto heaven, uh, sorry, unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema, accursed. Basically, damned to hell. That's the literal translation. If any preaches or adds on to or comes along and says, it's great that you love Jesus and you go to church and you say you're a Christian, but you also need... See, watch out for the Jesus and people. That's great that you have Jesus, but you also need and another thing. And they want to pervert the gospel, add to it. It's very easy, and it's, it's very appealing to our flesh also. As we said before, verse 9, So I say again, now, and if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or... Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There you have it. You want to be pleasing God or pleasing man? Are you called of God or are you called of man? Is it God's will or is it man's will? We do not desire the work of man. In fact, here at church, we try to do what we can not to draw attention to ourselves. We don't want people to think that this is about some certain person. We don't want attention to be drawn to any human being, any human effort. But rather, the attention ought to be on the Lord. And that, again, Paul's point is that I do this not to please men. The whole reason I'm writing this letter, the whole reason I'm laying this out, it is not so that men will be pleased. In fact, one of the reasons I know that this is God, God created it, this is God who came up with this, is it's so narrow-minded. It's there is one way to heaven. <laughs> one way to live. Do not add to it. What does men say? Even today, what do men say naturally in their minds? That can't be the case. There's good people all around. Again, falling into the trap of thinking somehow this is a good world. Somehow there is good in this world. Don't believe it for a second. There is nothing good apart from Him. 
apart from Him and His whole and the Holy Spirit ultimately. But watch out for another gospel. Watch out for imposters. Watch out for those that come and trouble you. They come along. They, they, Jesus called them wolves in sheep's clothing. They do not look like a wolf. They look like precious fellow sheep, Christians. They even sound like them. But watch out for them. I'm going to have a story at the end of the chapter to touch on even if an angel comes. But let's finish out the chapter first and we'll come back to that. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. What do you think Paul's trying to get across? <laughs> Verse 12, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Note that it is a single revelation. Not many visions, not many revelations, and I always cringe when someone tells me uh, the address and says it's in Revelations chapter 3 verse whatever. It is Revelation. There is no S at the end, ever. <laughs> and it's, it's important that we get the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus Christ. So, verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited, uh, profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who, by the way, separated me after I was born? Oh, no. Separated me from my mother's womb. Meaning in my mother's womb. I formed you in the womb. Is that not applicable for our day? Get the word out. This is when God calls people. When they are in the womb. Who do you think tries to put an end to that? Amen. So, and I was called by His, what? Grace. Again, Paul will champion grace. Paul mentions, by the way, grace in all of his letters collectively a hundred times. And if you look at the other writers of the New Testament, collectively, they mention the word grace 50 times. So it puts things in perspective. Paul really champions grace. In fact, it's, he's rightfully called the Apostle of Grace. He, that's what he wants to get across. That's what he knew very well because of his background. Verse 16, To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with, my, with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them, which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and I abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Verse 20, Now the, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. God is my witness, we might say. I'm not lying. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was no, unknown by face unto the churches of Judea. I'm sure Paul was glad about that. <laughs> they didn't recognize him, which were in Christ, the churches of Judea. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Hallelujah. Again, touching on, and if you haven't read it for yourself sometime, you could homework assignment, Acts chapter 9. And I always tell people you could start at chapter 7, which is a long chapter, but you get 
a brief history lesson through the whole Bible by one of the most sweetest saints of old, Stephen, the first martyr. We have a sweet guy here named Stephen too, so I just <laughs> wanted to touch on that. <laughs> but, but, but the Lord used Paul's life, ultimately. Even the times that were spent raging against and hating and despising and even murdering Christians, imprisoning them, splitting up families, taking children away from their parents and taking parents away from their children. He did that, consented to that. In fact, Paul the Apostle is the one who held that sweet Stephen's clothes in his hands as Stephen would be stoned brutally to death. That's who's writing this. Is it no wonder he would say, Grace, grace, grace. I never want to go to the Lord in prayer and say, Justice, bring justice. Why? Because I would be rightfully put in, in hell for all eternity. That is justice. But God. But Christ has, has died for our sins. The punishment that we deserved, He endured on the cross. The Father laid upon His Son, upon Jesus Christ, and took upon Himself. Jesus is God. Figure that one out. <laughs> took upon Himself the sins of the whole world that we might live, that we might be delivered from this body of sin, from this world of decay, from everything and everyone that's against Christ, against the living God. It made me think about when I was in my mother's womb. God called me. My mom's told me the story of when I was born. And she was freaking out because I wasn't right in the, the womb. I wasn't right in the head. I wasn't right in the womb. I needed to be flipped. And the doctor, I'm told, laid his hand on her and I just obeyed. <laughs> I flipped and I came out easy peasy. I had no control. I don't remember that. I had no control, right? When you're born again, you have no say. God chose you. God chose me before, not just in your mother's womb, before the foundations of the world. You want to really blow your mind. Incredible. Is it no wonder Martin Luther saw this and knowing his background, the legalist that he was caught up in. Is it no wonder he was enthralled? In fact, he's the one that discovered, in the first one I heard this from, that Romans and Galatians and Hebrews all have something in common. I meant to bring this up at the beginning of Galatians. It kind of belongs in the intro, but that all of them quote Habakkuk 2.4. What does Habakkuk 2.4 say? I don't know. Turn there and see but it says, the just shall live by faith. And this is really radical. Because who are the just? You find it in the book of Romans. How shall the just live? That will be here in the book of Galatians. What does by faith mean? Look at Hebrews. And especially chapter 11, right? By faith. So, Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith if Paul the Apostle is the writer of all three of those. Because Hebrews is questionable again. We don't know for sure that Paul wrote it, but it's safe to say he could have. And if not, the Holy Spirit did this and wrote this incredible trilogy with Romans, Galatians, and the book of Hebrews answering 
and following up on what Habakkuk 2 4, the just shall live by faith. And taking the just, the book of Romans, shall live the book of Galatians by faith, the book of Hebrews. Pretty radical. I love that. And it's it's it was Martin Luther that originally discovered that in his in his search and in his uh, his studying. Um, but I was going to say that there was this story that lines up with even if another angel comes, because this story has always made me scratch my head. If you're an Old Testament buff, you might relate. But First Kings chapter 13. You don't really have to turn there. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it for you. But I'm going to turn there so I don't miss anything. 1 Kings chapter 13. The whole chapter. But that's why I'm going to paraphrase. There was this young prophet that came onto the scene. And it was uh, King, uh, it was Jeroboam who was standing by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar saying, uh, in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high place that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day. Well, it came to pass now that this uh, man of God came along which had cried against the altar of, in Bethel, and he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his, that is Jeroboam. Lay hold on uh, the man of God. And his hand, which he put forth, dried up, so that he could not pull it back to himself. And the altar was torn, and the ashes poured out on the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had actually given chapters previous to this, uh, the man of God here in the story uh, prophesied and said this would happen. The altar would split and that Jeroboam would, uh, his hand would be withered. And uh, the king answered and said unto the man of God at that moment, entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand might be restored. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's hand was restored again. God is merciful, isn't he? And became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself. Now listen up. I will give you a reward, the king told the man of God. 1 Kings 13, verse 8. The man of God said unto the king, I, If thou wilt give me half of your house, I will not go with you. Neither will I even eat bread or drink water for the, in this place. For so was I charged by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink any water. Do not go again. Um, go back to your hometown, to your people. And now, verse 11, There dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his, his sons came and told him all the stuff that happened with the man of God and with the king Jeroboam and how his hand withered up and God used this man of God to, to heal him. And so... He said to his sons, let's go after him and meet him. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak tree. And he said unto him, Art you the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return or go with you or eat bread with you or drink water. For I was charged by the word of the Lord. You will not eat bread nor drink any water until you come again unto your people. And he said unto him, I am a prophet just like you. An angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back and give him food and drink. But, this is kind of a side note the writer puts in there, he lied unto him. So he went back his way, and it came to pass as the man, as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord then came to the prophet that brought him back and cried unto the man of God, saying, that you that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as you have disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and have not kept the commandment of the Lord, but you went back, you drank water, you ate, <laughs> it, 
uh, eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the uh, sepulcher of your fathers. In other words, you will die in a foreign place and you're not in your in your hometown with your people. And it came to pass after he had eaten, after he had drunk, he saddled the ass and, and went his way. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way. This is what intrigued me as a, as a kid reading this. And he killed him. The lion chewed him to death, slew him. But his carcass was cast in the side, in the way. And the donkey stood by, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by, and saw the carcass cast aside, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it to the old prophet. The old prophet then comes, takes that young guy, carries him off, and gives him a proper burial. What is the moral of that whole story? <laughs> It's fascinating, isn't it? That's in the Bible. Watch out when somebody's lying. When somebody says, an angel told me to just bring you back. You can relax. You were used mightily in the king's presence. God's used you. How important it is for us to keep to the Word of God simply not complicating things, not worrying about whether this person says they're a prophet or not, whether this person says they're, oh, I go to Calvary Chapel too, or not. It's the Word of the Lord. It's the Word of the Lord. Not the Word of man. Not the Word of any angel. Even if an angel comes to you, let them be accursed. And God will ultimately he's, he shows us the things that are important, right? Because we get caught up, we get sidetracked, we forget that it's so simple. Jesus Christ came for sinners and I am a sinner. I need to be saved. There's no righteousness whatsoever in me. And I want to be one that champions grace, like Paul. Not steps on grace. Not tries to sell grace. Like, you can do whatever you want. Come to Jesus. Like so many do. A proper understanding of grace will give you incredible reverence. Respect. You will walk into the house of God reverently. I'll be still and know that you are Lord. And He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do not get caught up in works-based stuff. Because we can do that. We can get into routines, we can get into habits, we can get into... Areas where we think because we did our devotions today, God owes us. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, to ever say that God owes you anything, get a proper understanding. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Understand, we all go to the same place. Rich or poor, foolish or wise, we all die. That's the sobering and serious and fact of the matter. We're all headed for death. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready? We're practicing for heaven, aren't we? We ought to be. That's why if you find, or if you lose your life, you'll find it. If you really want to live, then die daily to your flesh, to your needs, your own stuff, whatever it is. We talked about that in great detail on Sunday morning with the I problem. The middle letter in the word pride, the middle letter in the word sin. This is not what I want. This is I, me, me, and I. It's the root of sin, and it is the root of legalism and religion as well. I, me, 
and exalting humans, putting popes and priests and prophets and pastors and whatever they call themselves, bishops and all of these different things that people put up. Get away from that because it's so appealing to our flesh. We love tradition. We love rituals. But stay true, right? Stay true to the gospel. Have a passion for the gospel. Don't have a passion that we only sing hymns at our church. <laughs> have a passion for the cross of Jesus Christ, for the blood that was shed. Be someone who's obsessed with the gospel message and not anything else, not any other book, not any other movie, not any other pastor, any other teacher, any other stuff that's out there. It's Jesus. And it's so simple. And we complicate it. Pretty naturally, we come along and add our twist. We have help. <laughs> yeah. Father, help us to keep, keep it simple. Lord, help us to remember the main thing and to keep the main thing the main thing. Lord, that you have risen from the dead. Lord, that you died and rose again and that you live and you bring life that's abundant life, that is eternal life. And Lord, apart from you, there is no good thing. Help us to remember that. Help us to keep our eyes on you, fixed on you, Lord, as we look around at the distractions, the things that come our way, whether it's an angel, whether it's some re uh, revelation, whether it's whatever it might be, Lord. Help us, help us, help us to filter everything through your living, powerful word, which does divide and show what is carnal and what is spiritual. Lord, that is how we know. It's by your word. And be with us as we sing these last couple of songs. Help us to truly enter into worship, into that sense of awe and wonder and giving you praise and honor and glory because you deserve all, all glory, all honor. It all belongs to you. Amen.